Welcome to the show. We hope you have a blast. Thanks for making time for the Dealer Talk Podcast. Another business leader, here's a penny for your thoughts. This ain't a regular conversation, baby. This that Dealer Talk. Yeah. What's going on? Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm flying solo today, but that's okay because we got a great guest, Mr. Gordon Tomolin. Did I get that right, man? Yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I always give credit because with a name like Tarmolin, heck, I was nine nine years old till I got it right. So what the heck? <laughs> right on, man. Well, we're very excited to have you on the show. You know, the season has been very, very educational. I was just talking to Charity about this um, during our last session, um, just learning a ton about um, the independent side of the business and. Just be able to partner up with the NIADA for this uh, for the season has been super educational for us. So, thank you, thank you. Um, Glad to be here. Yeah, we kick things off here with a uh, with an intro. So tell us about you. I'm, well, I'm your your run of the mill, humble, lovable used car dealer uh, <laughs> with with 50 years experience in the business. So I uh, my dad started in 1940. Our family's been in the car business for 83 years. I came along in 73, so I'm running up on 50 years, which is just weird to me. Um, started on the franchise side. Um, at the at the time that I joined in, my dad was a Chevrolet dealer. Um, he was in with a partner, sold out of the partnership, and he and I bought a bankrupt Chrysler store together. Um, we ran that for about 20 years, had a lot of successes. You know, Started out with 10 employees, wound up with 72 by the time we finished. Wow. Um, I had an internal theft, which is less than fun, I assure you. Um, but we determined that it was wise to sell the franchise to, to bail out and fix that situation. And when we did, I had a small used car buy here, pay here operation that we had been running since about 92. And the new guy didn't want anything to do with it. So I just moved two blocks up the hill to that. And I've been doing it for 20 years now. So that's that's the quick view anyway. Right on. So I'm always interested, um, like we've had a couple of people here that have been on both sides. And I'm always interested when I when I have people with your experiences to ask about what is your um, what's the bridge, man, between independent and franchise? How can what's the biggest lesson, and how can more importantly, how can they collaborate? If if any, well, I, I think first of all, the bridge, the real opportunity for collaboration, where they really are very common. We're all in in the transportation space, obviously. Okay. Um, a new car store is a great training ground because they are very systematized. There's a structure to it. Mm. It lends over to the independent side. But honestly, the most successful new car guys, the most ins- the successful retail guys, the most successful buy here, pay here, lease here, pay here guys that I know are true to their core. They're entrepreneurs. So whatever the business is, they determine how they're going to structure it, how they're going to brand it, how they're going to build it. And they work up from there. It's far harder to do to, to do that in a franchise system than it is sure. independently. Yeah. Do you think it's wise for? And I and I know this stuff happens. And, and you know the better ones that I know, like for example in the Las Vegas or, or you know California or um, even Colorado regions where I consult a lot, mm-hmm. um, there seems to be partnerships with some independent dealers and some franchise dealers. Like they'll send people t- to each other and, and things of that nature. But do you think it's wise to have a, a some sort of program where we help the customer graduate, right? So they maybe they don't have good credit, and then they start at the buy here, pay here, and they move up until they go and they get their brand new car, right? Something yeah. like that. 100%. And so depending on the marketplace and, and your offerings, okay, you can graduate a person from just, you know, the, the, the bottom level of I'm stuck buying cash cars because nobody will help me into a buy here, pay here, honor that agreement, do it well into secondary, into conventional banking and, and you know, move up in, in terms of quality and newness of vehicle at the same mm-hmm. time. It's it's a it's a long process. It doesn't happen in six months. Sure. But, you know, they, they've got to prove themselves and they've got to work their way up into that that world. Um, but we also see in, in our experience, and we're very, very relationship based with our customers. We've got we've got customers been buying us from us for 20, 25 years and they prefer the way we do business. So we'll go out and we'll get them a newer unit or they'll just continue to do buy here, pay here because they enjoy doing business with their friends. And so it's the relationship kind of determines where they can go with that. Yeah, no, for sure. That's that's another of the advantages I see with the independent side as a whole. It's just it has to be more relationship focused. 
for the most part, I mean, there's some, there's some situations where, where that doesn't transpire, but for the most part, the ones that I've worked with and consulted with, they're super hyper-focused on the experience more so than franchise dealerships. Yeah. I think the franchise guys will, will presume that they've got X number of customers coming and, and we did this when we looked at the Chrysler store coming out of a Chevrolet background. I wasn't sure what the heck Chrysler was all about at that point in time. You know, Iacocca was a big deal with Chrysler back in that era. But what really is this? And we started looking at customer base and how many people were driving within our county. And, and suddenly we realized the customer base was as large as Chevrolet. But they were going elsewhere because they weren't being well cared for. So we, we focused everything on, on care of the customer and relationship. And we pulled that business back. And that store really, really worked well. Yeah. So um, uh, as one of the one of the bigger advantages um, that we've talked about here have been 20 group uh, relationships on the buy here, pay, pay side, on the independent side. Do, do you participate in that? Do you like that experience? We have right now. I'm not in a 20 group, but it has high value. Um, NIADA has over 300 dealers in 20 groups right now. Um, and they've got a very expansive program and they and they they operate it by business model. So if you're lease here, pay here. Um, if you're secondary finance, if you're buy here, pay here, if you're conventional retail, if you've got service operations, we've got a finance group just for F&I managers, things of that nature. And mm -hmm. and all of that is specific to what you're trying to get out of it. But having that board of directors and, and other opinions really, really is helpful. It's it's key to success. Yeah, no, I, I, that's one of the things I was talking about. Um, I think it was Bill, um, one of the moderators for NIDA and I think that that's a, um, I think two things for just from conversations, a lot of decision makers on the independent side, they're, they're concerned about sharing their information. And I think that that's a big deterrent for some of them. And I wish that that was, that they had more understanding or that was, that there was just a better way of how to break that down because there's really no a risk, right? You're talking to people outside of your sure. market. Um, you know what I mean? It's just a different setup. It, and it, it two, can be set up completely different. You know, as far as geography and all the rest of it. So, yeah. And number two is I've never been to a 20 group that I didn't pick something up that I didn't go like, oh, man, that's a really good idea. Uh, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I mean, your, your, your cost of going to a 20 group meeting is about five hundred dollars plus your hotel bill and, and all the rest of it. It's pretty easy to get your money's worth out of that and make mm -hmm. money on every meeting. And that's that's the key. That's what you're looking for. If it doesn't drive value to you, then you need to find a different group. Yeah, no, for sure. So highly, highly encourage, um, you know, decision makers tuning in to really give that a shot because I think they're, they're missing out. Yeah. It's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. Um, okay. Kind of moving the conversation along. I'm curious to get your perspective on 2023. What, what are your thoughts? You know, it's going to be a weird year. <laughs> of course, we've been saying that for three years now. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> um, what we're finding thus far, and, and I'm, I'm very, data driven when we do our sales forecast we'll we'll forecast three months out week by week from nice. what we anticipate um in january we were pretty close to what we had modeled we came up a couple of units short february has been very spotty um and it's not uncommon if you if you if you take a look and really consider what your customer is doing what's happening in their life okay they're finding that the, there's a delay on tax refunds and more folks are being audited because of the monies that they were given over the last couple of years. Now the government wants to make sure that they were reporting correctly, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So that's slowing the marketplace up, but we see demand is pretty steady. And so I, I think, you know, what we don't capture in February, we'll probably capture in March and in suing for the remainder of second quarter. So it'll, it'll be interesting. I, I think by mid year, we'll know if, if the mentality of recession has really caught up with folks. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's going to, it's, it's going to fall in different places, Herb, in terms of what you're marketing to. Um, in buy here, pay here, we're fairly steady. We've always got an income stream based upon the interest that we collect and things of that nature. So that protects us a little bit. We can, we can, we can ride the ebb and flow a little bit more. Mm -hmm. if you're great retail. It gets a little panicky when you get to the end of the month and you're at 60% of your goal. So it's, it, it may, I, I think, at least by mid-year, we'll know kind of where that's going. Well, I, I, let me ask you this. Do you think, uh, quote-unquote, like an official recession will be um, in our in our immediate future? I think in reality, we've been in a recession for mm -hmm. probably at least one or two quarters. Yeah. And so I think now it's, it's, a, it's a matter of how much it's promoted by the news media, 
versus how much normality people are able to find in their lives. You know, food prices, things of that nature are coming down. So that gives consumers a little more disposable income and a little bit more confidence so far mm -hmm. as that goes. Um, NIAD is very carefully watching that data and analyzing it so that, you know, we're able to report to dealers what kind of an economy they can expect on a quarter by course at quarter basis. So it's, I don't know. It, and, and there are differences in marketplaces too. So, so do you think, I think that that's beneficial for, for the independent side, right? Because there's going to push some, some credits are probably, we're already seeing, you know, six fifties, even six eighties in some cases, some cases, excuse me, get turned down. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is going to help a lot of independents buy here, pay here dealers um, kind of capture some of that business. What are your thoughts? I, I fully agree with that. I, I think buy here, pay here dealers are going to have a good year regardless on, on the whole. But the thing that, that each dealer has to determine within their market. Okay. So I'm, I'm a small dealer. Um, I, I try and keep my market radius about a 30 mile uh, zone around our, our business. So if we have mm -hmm. to do field calls and repossessions, it doesn't take half a day for our folks to get to them. When we take a look at the customers that come into us during times like these, if they're traditionally, you know, conventional buyers and so forth, a, they're going to be more picky about the car. Uh, there will be less appreciation of our program. In, in short, they're not necessarily our own long-term customer. So they take a little bit different handling in order to, to cultivate that relationship and help them to understand what we're going to do, sell the value of, of our program, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, so there may be a spike that then eases off in two or three years based upon that. So, so yeah, um, I, I think that, that um, even with, even if we do go into some, some down times, what I've been talking a lot about on the show is that, you know, it's not like 08, 09, where there wasn't any um, customers and we had this surplus of inventory. I think the thing that, that's really on our side in all aspects, obviously you guys have the interest. The interest side is, is obviously beneficial for, again, for independents and buy here, pay here. But as a whole, as an industry, I think the fact that we have pent up demand and we don't have nowhere near the levels. I mean, we're talking about millions of cars that are missing, right? And there's pent up demand, people that didn't transact during COVID because they wanted to wait or, you know what I mean? They weren't in cycle or whatever. Sure. So I think that that's the big key differentiator and, and one that I think we're, we're, we're kind of not taking into consideration when we're talking about, you know, forecasting or predictions. No, I think you're exactly right. It's going to push values up on vehicles for a longer term. Mm -hmm. This was a bubble of what, five, six million units that never made their way to market as new vehicles. And it will continue to press its way through, you know, late models and CPOs and then into mid range cars. And then eventually down to the buy here, pay here market. Yeah. And those prices will be elevated because of that. And that imposes a number of pressures. I mean, yeah, there's the pricing, but particularly for buy here, pay here customers, it's payment pressure, down payment, you know, yeah. amount, things of that nature. All of those things are going to affect our marketing. And we're going to have to find ways around it. What what the particularly the buy here, pay here dealer does not want to do is purchase an elevated car and then extend term just to keep the payments comfortable with the customer. Because when you do that, you increase the, the, the probability of mechanical issues and so forth that are going to affect your customer relationship. So you want to be able to get the customer locked down into a short term to understand the value proposition of paying it off quickly and not paying extra interest and all the rest of it. So that it, it may impose some market factors in terms of how we sell and how we present our value proposition in that regard. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to kind of pick your brain on um, just to kind of get a better understanding, I don't know if this is a factor or not. I would assume that as time progresses, just like on the franchise side of things, it's going to be more and more the case, but what, what about digital retailing, selling to customers online? Is that something that you that is at the forefront? Is that something that you run into on a, on a regular basis or, or not yet? I think it is very much on the forefront of the retail market. So if, if I'm just doing conventional finance and I want to find buyers and I want to make things easy and convenient for them, I would absolutely be looking at that all day long. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, even in, in our state, uh, Carvana is working with the New Car Association right now to pass legislation to make it easier to sell online. And it, it had a lot to do with accepting digital signatures and things of that nature. I, I would 100% be on board for that. It's a little different animal by here, payer, because we want to form a relationship with that customer. Sure. Yeah. We need to spend time 
building that relationship. So in that regard, sometimes digital can be a problem. <clears throat> so particularly when we're, we're, you know, we're, if we're, I would never go out to the Chicago market, which is 120 miles away from me and just start retailing cars. I could put a lot of them out, but then I'd have to find them and all the rest of it. So actually seeing that person and verifying information in person is a high value for me as a buy here, pay here dealer. Retail, different animal. Um, I think also, and, and NIADA is doing a, a lot with us right now. We've got a new um, certified pre-owned 360 program. And yeah. it's, it's a very dynamic program. There's a lot going on with it. But you know, one, one of the things that will soon make its way into that is, you know, after, after the, the CPO program's online and we're doing digital inspections, we have a, a network of 16,000 places where people can go get their service through TechNet, which is a, a division of Advanced Auto. And then we'll start doing concierge deliveries. And that's right down the lane of online and making it convenient for the customer, wherever they may be. So, so you, you, so you do run into it. Do you have customers that, that are calling you like, you know, you're in, where, where are you, where's your store? A little town called Freeport, Illinois. So in Illinois, maybe somebody on, in, I don't know, Seattle or something that finds your car online or whatever. Do you get people like that calling you like, Hey, I want to buy this car, ship it to me, sort of a deal. It's, it's more regionalized, but occasionally. Um, yeah. I also dabble with some classic cars and so forth, and, and we've sent those right. all over the country. Yeah, so, so for the right car, of mm -hmm. course, you're going to get people coming everywhere. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by the whole aspect. It's one of my biggest pet peeves on the franchise side because when they talked about it like, not they, the vendors that come and they pitch on these products, they talk about it like, Oh, this is the car the answer to Carvana, but it's not really, man, because you're, it's not shipping the customer the car to their house. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, they can start the deal or, or work the deal in some way, shape, or form, but we still want the customer to show up, right? We still want the customer mm -hmm. present at the at the dealership. And so, um, I don't know, man. I don't think that that's fully baked yet. Well, I think. And, and yeah, here's. Yeah, Here's a little bit of wisdom or lack thereof, okay? But if, if you stop and think about what it takes to transact business, you know, you're talking mm -hmm. about an object that somebody needs that may cost twenty or thirty thousand dollars, or maybe it just costs eight thousand dollars. Whatever the market space, it's a significant amount of money for that consumer, okay? And and so in order to sell that and make it worth their while, you have to provide sufficient value that they're willing to part with their money. The value exceeds what the money is worth. It's worth, to them, yeah, okay. Sure. Simple proposition, okay? In in my years in the business, and, and I was raised by a guy that, that, you know, left good jobs because they treated customers poorly, okay? But if you're on a transactional basis, you can get on the internet and you can sell them for $100 over invoice or, you know, ten you know $10,000 below Kelly Blue Book or whatever the case might be. You can make it sound good and you can transact a lot of business, but then you find the kind of complaints that, you know, some of the car and some of these other folks get where, oh, I got the car and it was missing the lighter and it's a piece of junk and rah, 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 you know, and nobody told me about the den and the fender. You know, those kind of things will give you poor ratings. Um, they, they cause you headaches because you got to find a way to make right with them. If instead you pursue a relationship, which does require that you spend some time, even if you do it on a Zoom call or whatever, you've got to spend some time with that consumer and get to know them. And if you spend invest that kind of time, you you'll get a higher gross and you'll stay in business longer. That's the that's the heck of it. Yeah. So it's to me it's 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 essential to be relationship, not transactional. Yeah, you, you you're bringing up a really good point, man. There's a there's kind of like a um there there there's a, there's a how do I say it? Like there's a, there's a piece missing to that philosophy. Um, the, you know, are we really going to do this with used cars when there's the, the propensity for issues is so much greater, right? A new car is different because you can go and test drive that at your local dealer, you know, you like the car. Now it's just a matter of the features Does it have this color, this trim, whatever, does it have these features and you can get your car that way. Um, even, even on a new car, Herb, I mean, when we have the new car store, okay, we trained our sales staff so that you know, in concept, they sold four things. They sold their personal integrity, sold the brand, which is why the people came there. But they mm -hmm. also sold the integrity of the Tremolin brand and, and what our dealership did that was different than others. And then they sell the service experience. If, if you're doing nothing online, but here's your car, here's your price, you know, I'll, I'll email you the paperwork. You don't get that value proposition, you know, 
really conveyed to your customer and it affects your gross profit. It affects their loyalty. When you watch loyalty go down, it's a sign that we're doing things transactionally and we're not paying attention to what the customer really wants. So effective in a new car store, very effective in a used car store, regardless mm -hmm. if your proposition is CPO, regular retail, classic cars, or buy here, pay here, is spending time with the customer and making them friends first, providing them with a value that exceeds is, is where the whole thing begins. And, yeah. and you know, I would argue with you that it, that's the key. You know, I, I see all these kind of articles, there haven't been as many lately, but you know, industry experts who say, we're going to transact business in 20 minutes. Really? Would you spend 40, 50 grand on a vehicle in 20 minutes? Because I sure as heck wouldn't. No. no what no. I have found forever is when I spend an hour and a half, two hours or more with a customer, they trust me. I trust them. We're talking on the exact same level because we've both invested the time to do that. And that's when you get to the point where they're just pleased as punch and, and yeah. they leave and they're proud and they're happy of what they've spent because they, they've got something that they understand the full value of. Yeah. No, you're, yeah, for sure. And I agree with that. I agree that we're focusing, we're probably focusing on the wrong thing to a certain degree. We should be, when we talk about the experience, it's not so much sell me the car without going to the dealership. It's maybe making that, that shopping experience better. Yeah. Right. While I'm at the dealership, don't make me wait four to five hours. Like you said, bring it down to something more realistic, like an hour and a half, two hours. If we just focused on that itself, I think that there's more value in that for the consumer than it is. Can you ship my car to me without me ever having? Because the reason they don't want to go to the dealership is because you're, they feel like you're wasting their time. Well, and, and you know, it, it, what has to happen before any of that occurs is as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you've got to know what your market is and what you're trying to accomplish. You've got to have a vision and a mission statement in place, and you've got to have a structure, a selling structure that, you know, this is what we're going to do. We maybe you know, in our store, we've got 13 steps to a sale. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it begins with meeting and greeting, but it's counseling and it's showing on the car and it's confirming that that's, you know, we're answering the questions they have, all of these things. It's if you take an hour and a half of a customer's time and it's not high value, now you're wasting their time and they right. probably won't come back. But if it's engaging and it's high value and it's responding to the concerns that they have, you're going to sell a car. Oh yeah, no, for sure. But five hours, no. What what's the average right now? Four to five hours? That's too much. Oh no, that's 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 grueling and it's hard on yeah. everybody. Yeah, for sure. So no, that's a great point, man. I totally agree. I think that that's that's better time because the other thing too, and I've talked about that on the podcast as well. But dude, we've been, dealers have been selling cars online for a really long time. That's not like this thing. Like they don't promote it as the issue, and they don't want to, right? They don't want to like go out with that message. Like they want people to go into their into their place of business for your for what you were talking about earlier they want to build that loyalty right. they want to show them the the service department they want to show them hey welcome to the family sort of a deal you can't do that you know through a screen right we you know, we, we build touch points into that and we don't do as much with the independent store because we're smaller but when i had the the larger store and we were running 100 units a month and all the rest of it you know we had touch points as you'd tour them through the, the dealership we had a cookie bar and that became of all things a real selling point for the dealership but we, you know, we gave cookies out when they're sitting in the lounge, right? Went through 27,000 cookies a year. Wow. So you get a lot of churn and, of course, a couple chubby customers. But yeah. you know, that, that was a stopping point. And then you'd go into service and you introduce them to, to Harold and John, the guys working at the desk. And, mm. and you know, they're going to take care of you when you come in. We also do free pickup and delivery. If you don't have time, we'll come get it. You know, And then walk them around the corner. And we'd show them some of the technicians and stalls. But I also had a... Uh, uh, an information board up there that had a quote of the week and our customer satisfaction numbers and, and some productivity data so that people could see, Hey, geez, these guys went, they fixed 320 cars last week. Oh my gosh. You know, and all of that builds value and it makes sense to the customer. So the one thing, what, what you want to do in every situation, whether it's a buy here, pay here store, new car store, a, a CPO store, whatever the case might be, you want that customer, when you actually sit down to talk about price and figures and payments and all the rest of it, you want them thinking in the back of their head, man, I sure hope this works because I really like this place. This yeah. guy's decent. And, and now you've sold sufficient value to make it worth their time and their effort and their money to purchase the vehicle. Yeah, no, I love that. That's great. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates, 
and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealer talk. That's foureyes.io slash dealer talk. Um, all right, so moving things along, you you talked about something. Um, you talked about the certified program, which I'm super, super interested in. Mm-hmm. I, I had mentioned early on when I talked to Melanie uh, that I used to be, um, I used to work for Cox Automotive and I, one of the, yeah. I was a rep for Auto Trader KBB. And during my time with them, they had, uh, they were going to do the certified thing through KBB. And we actually had a couple of pilot stores here in Las Vegas that I, that were my, under my, you know, under my book of business. And so, um, I was, I was personally excited for that because one, I thought obviously this is an opportunity for us to, um, go help some, some independent dealers with something that's truly unique and different. And mm-hmm. two, um, I think it kind of levels out the playing field a little bit, right? It gives, it gives the independent a way to compete with the end with the franchise on, on the, on the certified level. Mm-hmm. And I'm all for competition, man. I think competition is great. I mean, we all win when we compete. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, that, um, it motivates us, you know, to do better It motivates the industry to do better. Plus I think the certified program is going to do a lot of work towards the stigma issue that we have in this industry. Right. Yeah. So, because if we're doing it correctly, then we're, we're, we're making sure that our cars are standing tall and that just helps. It, it helps our image. So you being on both, right. Being on, be, having been on the, on the franchise side and know what that entails to certify a vehicle and now seeing this program, how do they compare? What are your thoughts? Do you think that it's apples to apples? I'll tell you what, Herb, I think we've got a superior program. Um, Dang, and, and, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not pulling punches. And, and let me give you a little history on NIADA CPO. Okay. We got into the CPO business back in the early 2000s, and it was an inspection designed by a group of dealers. And we had a warranty company working with it. And, and you know, we had several warranty companies over a period of time that all found that they, you know, under their standard program, it only worked in, under a certain niche. OK, so we went back to the drawing board and, and Lou Tedeschi, who's our past chairman, really, really took ownership of this thing. And he, it was his brainchild. And he worked with it and he worked with the folks at NIDA and the staff. What they came up with was a program that, A, offers, you know, steps that are important to a dealer. You can do a three-month, six-month, 12-month basic warranty on the car, all of which are upgradable and upsellable to a program that's far more profitable for the dealer and for the the, in the company. It is serviced through four different providers. So if, you know, if Southwest is is your, your company, you can use them. If you prefer, you know, uh, I can't remember the others right now. I'm not going blank, but you know, if you if you prefer a different servicer or if they provide more value to you as a dealer, you can choose who you're going to have for warranty company and still offer this program. Then it goes into we we partnered with a company called Carketa, who does an mm-hmm. outstanding job. Um, they 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 provide a digital inspection, so that everything that you do to this vehicle will be photographed with proof that this is what we did, this is what we inspected, and so forth. All of that can be uploaded to your website. So that when you're, you know, when people are just looking at the website, and it says CPO. Oh my gosh, they did the brakes. Look at that. Oh, that's what a tie rod is. All of those things are documented and 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 pictorially put on the website so that people can see what happens. Then after the vehicle sold, the servicing obviously can take place at the dealership because you want to build fixed operations if sure. you have that business. But if you don't, it's serviced through TechNet which has 16,800 shops across the nation. There's no franchise that has that many shops to go to. Yeah. Okay? No. Now compare all of this with a factory certified, which limits the miles to 80 or 100,000 miles. And it's got to be six years old or newer. And we just, we're going to plop it on there. And the cost is $600 to the dealer and you'll pay extra. Okay. That's a good program. But this goes to 10 years old and up to 125,000 miles or in the verified program, 12 years and 150,000 miles. So you can literally get a certified vehicle deeper into the marketplace where the prices are more attractive. Yeah, um, for the, for the duration of what what people are keeping their cars for, because what's the mean year now is like twelve years. So yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's wow. there's a lot of options. There's a lot of consumer focus, and, and and it came because we we turned our program around and said, okay, we need to focus on what dealers want what are consumers looking for and how do we make those two work together? Well, yeah. and that's, that's how it was developed. And, and we're, we're finding at NIEDA, we've, we've had a change in focus over the last two or three years to dealer driven 
type programs. And this is one of them that really is kicking that off. So this is dealer driven so they can increase profitability and longevity and loyalty of their customers. Gordon, let me ask you, how do you see that? Um, it sounds amazing. First of all, let me just say that in you, you what, two things that you said that got my, my ear. One, the, the care network, like mm -hmm. 16,000 shops. That's, I mean, like, that's, like you said, that's untouched, right? I mean, it's, it's like going to like having, I don't know, like pet boys or something like that be your, 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 your shop. Exactly. Um, the other thing is the mean year situation. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, and I, that, you know, that doesn't exist in the franchise side of, of, of the business. So that's, that's, an, yeah. that's, unless you have something internal or, you know, like a TCA or something like that, but most How, factory programs are limited to an off lease type unit, right. which is great, but doesn't qualify for everybody's budget. This sure. way you can get to where people can afford the car. Yeah. So it's very attractive from a consumer standpoint, no question. But how do you promote that? That's the, that's my, that's, that's my biggest thing. And that's why KBB canceled their, their certification program. And it's KBB, right? A trusted, um, 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 you know, brand in, in, in the, in the space. How do you promote it to customers so that they see the value in it? There, there are a couple of things that have to occur there. And, and Herb, I'd be telling you stories if I said we just got it all figured out. And it's, you know, it's, sure, sure, it's, sure. it's, in, it's in beta stage now. We've got, I think, somewhere around 50 dealers that have signed up since the first of the year on this program. So, But one of the things is we're being careful about the dealers that we sign up. I don't want the guy that went out and bought five 80,000 mile BMWs and he's just looking to warranty the thing to get it sold because that's going to destroy the program. Okay. Mm -hmm the dealer that understands exactly how to market CPO and how to build value for a customer and things of that nature. The other side of that is gaining acceptance from the car gurus and auto traders of the world. And, and very simply, we've had conversations once we have mass out there enough that, that they're satisfied that it's a, a sincere program, which won't take long, maybe three to six months, then they'll start treating this program on par with factory certified programs. And I think that'll be a great launching point at which we can really let this thing fly because consumers will now know, hey, used car guys got their own thing. They, you know, and, and we'll know it works when people walk into the store to ask if you're an NIED member and do you have CPO? Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, if they, if I think if the customer, if we get the information to the customer, like, you know, the, the basics of the program, it's a no brainer. Why would you not do it? It'd be dumb not to. I just, my, 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 Kind of where my mind goes is how the way that this is going to be promoted needs to be, there has to be a, you know, the right approach for the mm -hmm. consumer to, to have buy-in into it. You know what I Absolutely. mean? Yeah. And it's, but, there, there are, you know, there's marketing kits and things of that nature that we're working on, but it, it's, it takes a while to get that snowball rolling down the hill sure. where people have notoriety and they understand what it is. Yeah. So one of the things that I had asked before and I, I couldn't get an answer, I don't know if, if maybe you have an answer, but. Is this only available for independent dealers? It must be, right? It is only available for NIEDA members who are yeah. independent dealers. Okay. So NIEDA has approximately 15,000 member dealers nationwide, but we're working in a market space that, you know, legitimate, you know, not the, not the junkyard that has a dealer's license, but legitimate independent stores. The marketplace is, is north of 30,000 independent businesses across the nation. Yeah. And I, I, I've learned by being on the board for a number of years that, that independent is the number one factor that you can count on with these folks. Some of them just don't join things and so forth. That's, that's unfortunate and it's, it, it, it's to their own detriment. But, but the folks we're working with, that's who we, this program is, is gained, is really aimed at. It's funny to me that we don't have like, a, like an independent, um, like an auto trader, but for only independent dealers. You know what I mean? Or I know there have been attempts to at it. Um, mm -hmm. but of course, then the new car guys want to jump in because they think they're missing out on something. Right, right. There's the, but I just, just for the sheer volume, like there's this company, I'm not trying to like promote and I haven't gotten any money to for say this and, and, you know, just a fair disclaimer, but there's cars for sale, mm -hmm. like their $99 website. Yep. Like the, that whole concept and they're, it just works because of the, the sheer amount of volume of customers that, you know what I mean? That, that are on there. Yeah. And I guess there is a little bit more independent because if you have a website, you're on there, but I, I have seen a franchise dealers on there as well. So, um, 
I don't know. I just think like, you know, if there was spaces like that where consumers and independent dealers were connecting, mm -hmm. that would be a great place to, um, you know, that'd be a great platform to, to kind of kick this thing I, off. I agree. I mean, even when you look in the franchise space, you know, they've all got the factory provided website, but, but the smart ones have independent websites for the used car operations or they're heavily invested in car gurus and auto trader and all the others. You know, there's, there's a handful of those spots, you know, Edmonds and you know, yeah. KBB where, where consumers know to look. And it's, it's, it's a question for the dealer always of how much money do you want to invest and what, what are you going to get out of it? And will the consumers be there? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about what's going to happen with Facebook marketplace and things of that nature. Um, but you have to constantly be looking for customers. Yeah. Speaking of Facebook Marketplace, I do. I wanted to. This is a perfect segue, actually. I wanted to get your your thoughts on this because I'm thinking about peer to peer, man. I think that there's what the, the last numbers I saw was 45 percent transactions occur peer to peer, mm -hmm. and the peer to peer experience that exists right now is just part of my friend. Shit, it's <laughs> awful. It's just really bad. Yeah. Um, like my girlfriend's trying to been trying to sell her, her vehicle for the past couple of weeks. And we listed it on offer up horrible experience to list it. And then you get garbage. First of all, I got spammed immediately. Like, Hey, put your VIN number here. And the customer or people telling you like, yeah, I want to buy your car and question, question, question. And then you get down to the deal and they're like, Hey, I need you to go to this website and upload your VIN number on this thing. And you know that they're just trying to get you to, you know, maybe they're getting a commission or something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, there's no security, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't know who you're dealing with. They connect you to your to your social media profile. So the people that are looking at your car know where you live or, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a weird. Um, there, and there's no, um, it's just awful. It's just awful, awful. It's, it's the wild, wild west is what it amounts to. I mean, you know, we all know. On the internet, there's fantastic stuff and there's stuff you want to stay away from just in your personal life. Well, it's the same in terms of marketing your products and your business and all the rest of it. And I, I think the one thing I, I don't have an answer on her, but the one thing I would say is that you know, if, if you have an association of dealers like NIADA where you can you can meet the industry thought leaders and the vendors and the folks that are trusted and have some some track records that you can look at, um, I think you, you tend to have a better experience. But I, you also, as an entrepreneur, you have to be looking. I mean, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I wasn't worried about SEO. Now I know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's so a great point. Things like you, you have to seek education. And, you know, I've been, as of August, I will have been 50 years in the car business. I started when I was 13. So, okay. You know, but, you know, the, the, the things that I thought back then are completely, you know, different than what the reality is in today's marketplace. And it'll be different again five years from now. Sure. So, Regardless of the amount of experience I've got, it only takes me so far. I've got to constantly be reading and learning and looking and trying to get better. And that's where your association steps in and really, really helps you. Yeah, for sure. So really quick, because I, I, I just want to ask you this one question about this thought. But don't you think that um, it's it, – don't you think that if a company focused on the experience of selling your car peer-to-peer – that would be something that that could potentially be problematic for the industry, like made it easy, maybe a step by step. Here's how you do it. Take the photo, upload it, do it this way, do the video, get a bill of sale, meet with the customer at the police station. Um, you know what I mean? At their their uh, design, their designated parking stuff and like educated the consumers on how to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, man. Like, I just think like it's so bad that it's just right for somebody to come in there. And I think there's an opportunity there, but I don't know that there's anybody that's prepared to do that. I, you know, eBay tried to step in and, and yeah, you know, provide and some of that. And it's, and it's fallen apart because the competition came up with better ways. And, you know, and then it's, yeah. so it's, I, I still, it's, it's the wild, wild west. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think there's anything that's just going to be the magic cure for it. Agreed. Agreed. But anyway, maybe we should build it, Gordon. You and me, man. Let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll put that on the agenda for our certified master dealer program. We'll get that developed. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, man, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been a fun conversation for me. Uh, there is one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show. But before we get there, I do want to get your thoughts quickly on 
Carvana. What do you think? Um, it you know, like overall, what do you think about the whole situation? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a lot to unwrap. I, I think you know, just like we talked about earlier, Carvana is predicated upon a, a, a transactional model. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so for them, in order to, for them to succeed and do the volume, they've been paying too much for used cars. Well, guess what? Now, you know, now they're come up and they're going to come because market values are coming down somewhat on used vehicles. Um, in, in the process, they've not, you know, and I'm one of the states where they got their license suspended for, for quite a period of time. They apparently work something out of the Secretary of State now. But if you can't handle getting a, a title to your consumer within 30 days or whatever, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. You know, they, they don't have solid processes all the way through. So they're, there's something missing there. And until they address that, I think they're good. They're very, very iffy. Yeah. Um, I think they brought some great things to the marketplace. You know, I don't necessarily need a vending machine building in Freeport, Illinois. Okay. But they, they, they got notoriety doing that. And, and they, they built their, their web presence to the point where people can transact. It's just the details fell apart and there was nobody there to handle the customer service aspect. And now you got complaints. Yeah. So I, they've got some work to do if they're going to make it. Um, you know, the, the other side of that is with a capitalization like they've got, that debt does roll around and catch you sooner or later. Yeah, well, they're, uh, I was predicting that they would file for bankruptcy yet before yesterday because their um, their um their quarterlies number came out and I thought that they would, they would just, that would be it. 7.6 or $7.1 billion in debt. Yeah. I don't know how they managed to keep that going. Well, I think our morning news today showed that they were in a position where they lost pretty close to $8 per share. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's a, that's not a good thing. Yeah, no, for sure. I, um, we had uh, we had uh, Steve uh, Stoning on the on the on the program here for a special Carvana episode. He wrote this article back in 2017, predicting not the way that it fell, but that Carvana would fail because it just from a math standpoint, it didn't pencil. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my, my thing with it is what happens if let's say that it goes down. How can dealers benefit from it? There's got to be a way that um, that can be leveraged. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of inventory, probably go back to, I think Ally is their number one um, mm -hmm. bank for that kind of stuff. So they'll have a bunch of inventory to dispose of. But for me on the marketing side, you know what I mean? Like put some marketing campaigns out there like, hey, did you buy a car from Carvana or stuff like that, that you could le really leverage? I, I think there are a couple of takeaways out of that. I mean, yeah, there'll, there'll be some market space opened up, but don't think for a minute that somebody's not going to try and jump back into that market space. I mean, sure. you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of vehicles a year. Somebody's going to want a piece of that pie. For sure, um, there will be individual markets where there's going to be some space freeze up, and, and customers can capitalize on it. Um, but the other thing is, what lessons could you learn from what they did well and what they did poorly? You know, if if, if they've yeah, they, they've certainly created an appetite amongst consumers to do everything mm -hmm. online. Um, you know, that's, that's transactional. So how can that be modified to make it work relationship wise so that you can build a business based on that? Um, I think you have to go back to, to intelligent metrics in terms of vehicle values. You know, they tried to take market share by paying a ton for vehicles. I mean, gosh, there were dealers that would, you know, that could actually get more than their retail price by selling it to Carbon. Yeah. Something's wrong there. That's, that's, that's not a good algorithm. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, this, that's going to have to return back to a market value, whatever that may be per unit. OK, and, and if somebody can can capture the good things they did and keep their their metrics in place. Yeah, there's tremendous opportunities. there. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, uh, thank you so much, Gordon, for doing this. We really appreciate it. There is one question that we ask everybody that comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? Five years is a, that's, that's a, that's a, an eternity in car business. <laughs> um, well, first of all, Herb, it's been a pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed this great conversation. Um, in you. terms of, you know, where does the industry go in five years? People are not, you know, you, you hear autonomous vehicles, you hear, you know, all sorts of things. People are not going to give up the freedom that they enjoy with vehicles. There will be a marketplace for vehicles regardless. The, the, the price situation is going to be conundrum. 
um, particularly on the new car side, because I think they're bumping up at a point where they're going to start losing new car volume because a new car is costing, you know, forty five, fifty thousand dollars on average transaction. OK, um, and that will reflect in terms of used vehicle values and, and what happens. It's a marketplace, no different than a stock market. So so those things are going to have to be adjusted to. I think consumers will adjust as well as entrepreneurs. In terms of how vehicles are sold, I, I really believe that the most successful operators will continue to find ways to build a relationship with the customer and build value. Um, I don't think, I mean, you, know, we, you can go back into the 70s and 80s and there were guys that were selling brand new cars for $49.95 over invoice, you know, and those guys all went out of business. It does not make sense to be the cheapest guy in the room. You have to find a way to write gross profit that's sufficient enough that you can you can have a return on your investment. And so that'll always be a problem for those guys that stay transactional. It'll be less of a problem for those guys who are relationship based because they have more value. The customer is willing to pay more for that vehicle and they can maintain a reasonable profit and stay in business. So I think you'll see a, a migration toward that. There's an interesting thing. And we, pardon me if I sidebar here a little bit. We, we, we've no. been working on the certified master dealer program, which you and I didn't get a chance to talk about. But that's a college level course for a dealer to really understand every single attribute from the initial value proposition down to building five year business plans for dealers to go through that NIADA will soon be offering again. We've had it for a number of years and we we shelved it and rethought it. And it's it's coming out again later this year. But as we did the research for that, um, we took a look at a lot of different operations. And, and one of the things I found interesting was in, in my little Chrysler store in, in, in a small town of 25,000 people, we were expanding market and doing well by expanding services further out. So we did free pickup and delivery for service for 50 mile radius. And, and, and you know, I'm, I don't care if they want an oil change. We'll send a guy out, pick up the car, bring it back and do it. What we found was loyalty went over over the top on that. And it's because we're doing what the customer wants and trying to make life easier for them. Every single time we do that, if we'd call them back and say, hey, you know, everything's fine on your car, they go, wait a minute, did you check the brakes? Because I'm not sure about, you know, and, and we'd wind up upselling eight times out of 10. Okay. And you know, when, when we'd pick up the car, we'd, we had former salespeople that were retired and those, these guys miss people in the worst way. They'd pick up the car. I got to the point where people would ask, you know, hey, is Fritzy available to pick my car up? Because if he's not, I can wait until Thursday. You know, and it, you see building relationship and value with those people. OK, what I'm finding is we did the research on CMD. Is that type of business model is working everywhere. People used to tell me, that, oh, yeah, you can do that in Freeport, but, you know, you can't do that in Chicago. Well, um, it, if, if you Google brand Ben stock on, on LinkedIn, they run a Honda store in New York City and uh, Paragon Honda. Paragon it's Honda, yeah. One of the top volume Honda stores in the world. Yeah. And they're doing exactly that. They're 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 Uber drivers out to pick up the customer's car and bring it back and do the service and take it back to them. So there are things that you can do in every single marketplace to build a relationship and build value. The dealers that do that will succeed and be stronger than ever five years from now. The dealers that don't or say, ah, you can't do that. What they're really saying is they refuse to compete on that level. They just want people to come to them and give them money. And that's a dying business model, whether you're selling iPhones or cars. Yeah, no, there it is. I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Gordon, for doing this. We really, really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Excited to share this with everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. That's all the time that we have for today. And as usual, we'll talk later. We only host the well respected. The vendor Lexus Nexus. We don't sell digital marketing. What you do? We inspected what our DT vendor man is missing. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealertalk. That's foureyes.io slash dealertalk.